Next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving you the opportunity to rebound if necessary. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration to put these things of the Word of God together in our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Last time I established some parameters as part of an introduction, uh, and we can go over those briefly. First of all, can you be a Christian alcoholic? Yes, of course. Eternal security. You can be a Christian and do anything the unbeliever can do. In fact, oftentimes do it better because you have to overcome some things as a believer in order to get involved in certain areas of sins that continue on and on, continuous sinning. Uh, the second principle that we noted, God's love never changes. Just uh, When you believed in Christ, you received the righteousness of God the Father, a double portion, and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. As a result, it doesn't matter who you are or what you do. You have the righteousness of God. God loves his own righteousness with perfect love, and he has that same perfect love for the alcoholic Christian as he does for the non-alcoholic Christian or the Christian who is actually living the spiritual life doesn't matter. It's the same love. Now, it is expressed differently. In the case of the practicing alcoholic, there's punishment, all kinds of punishment, constant punishment. In the case of the self-righteous believer who never rebounds for gossip, maligning, and judging, there's constant uh, triple compound discipline. And it, it, so we, we understand that. And as part of uh, understanding alcoholism, you're going to have to be mature about the subject and not be silly and stupid as most believers are. Now can you recover? Of course. Uh, you know, people are cruel and they will say you can't, uh, you'll never be, you'll always be a drunk, you're a drunk now, you'll always be a drunk, that's all you'll ever be, etc. That's the cruelty of people and it's wrong thinking. And uh, it's really people trying to build their happiness on someone else's unhappiness, people trying to look down their nose at somebody to make themselves feel better. And really, they have problems themselves that can only be overcome by Bible doctrine, the same way you will overcome your problem. <clears throat> and really, it's not, um, it would be unusual for me to bring out a specific sin and point it out and then go into study on it, but when we study harmardiology, which would be all of the sins and that are mentioned in the Bible, I go over each one of them. Uh, in great detail. So, uh, the fact that I'm making a, a special on this one, I've made a special on gossip, on strife. Uh, it's just another area of weakness that uh, a person has. And the solution is the same, post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation, growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and yet there still are ten steps for both the alcoholic and the person involved in some other area of weakness. The solution's the same, the area of weakness is completely and utterly different, totally different in every way, uh, totally incompatible. Uh, a lot of times uh, Christians will get married because one Christian gossips a lot, another gossips a lot, and they both gossip and hate the same type of people, so they end up having great rapport of the old sin nature and they end up getting married. I mean, it, it's just part of being a human being with an old sin nature. It comes down from Adam. And again, another parameter is that if you are physically addicted to alcohol, see a doctor. Now this may help you in encouraging you to do so, and that would be the best help I could give you right now if you're physically addicted. Go to a clinic. Go to a hospital. Do what, uh, do what you need to do to physically wean yourself from that. You're not ready to do that. That's your choice, of course, volition. But the best advice I could give you is to uh, break from that slavery. Because you are enslaved. You are enslaved not to Christ, but to a substance. And you are physically, you cannot live without it physically. And a lot of people die because they run out of money. They, especially bums, a lot of bums who live under the who live on the street, if they run out of the alcohol and run out of the money to get it, then 
oftentimes they will uh, simply die from the fact they can't get it anymore and therefore their body is dependent on it and then it overshoots the field so far that uh, you go into cardiac arrest or uh, go into a seizure and just uh, pass on. And uh, some of the signs that you've taken or you've uh, you are an alcoholic, or perhaps you're irritable after you've drank too much, or you have um, you have more than just the regular hangover. That uh, oftentimes people who aren't alcoholics they they still may get drunk from time to time, and the only thing that they would uh, have is a hangover. The alcoholic has the hangover times ten. They because of the fact that what goes up must come down and. If you've gone way, way up for a long, long time, you're going to have to recover, and physically. And a doctor who is trained in this area would be able to help with those physical things. Now, as a pastor, I can help concerning the spiritual matters. After you get your body weaned off of it, then you have a chance to make it spiritually. Now, you may wean yourself off of it, become self-righteous, and never make it spiritually, and never have another drop ever again. And then you may even go to church and think that you weren't even saved before while you were saved at that time, but now you make a big deal out of it and get in front of the congregation and talk about how you were so awful and then Christ got you off of the alcohol. Well, through your own will, you know, you went probably through the rehab and whatnot, and then by your own will, you said, I'm not going to do that anymore. Why? Well, you remember how painful it was, and you make a smart decision. Then you hold that smart decision up as uh, something grand that no one else has ever done before when it's been done millions of times. Millions! You're nothing special. Who do you think you are? And then arrogance takes over. And then you become some self-righteous hypocrite. Then you start looking down your nose at the very same person you were, and you were a believer the whole time and didn't even know it. Now you're worse off. You're not physically addicted. You are a mental moron now. And you'll be held accountable for being a loser, even though you stopped drinking. whoop ti doo la ti da there is a spiritual life to live, and it's available to the self-righteous, and it's available to the alcoholic. As long as you're breathing, God has that availability for you. And today, with the medical science advancing so far, there's no reason for you not to recover if you're an alcoholic. None whatsoever. Oftentimes, the way they get you to recover is through opiates. Now, if you're addicted to an opiate and alcohol, that's called a dual addiction, you're up the creek. Oftentimes you'll just simply die. You can't mix the two. If you do, you will end up uh, going to sleep for very forever. <laughs> and of course your soul will depart and be in the presence of the Lord forever as a believer. But again, uh, I'm not going to tell you to stop cold turkey. That's going to be your decision based on how your body reacts. And you'll know if you need to see a doctor. Now, another question may be asked, and this is one that I did not delve into, but another parameter that we have to look at. Should you go to AA? Is it a Christian organization? Well, first of all, no, it's not. AA is a, an organization for the general public, and it does try to bring in spirituality, a power greater than yourself, but it's impossible to do so because there's no mechanics behind it, and they're also dealing with unbelievers. So... Should you go to AA? Well, that's actually going to be your choice. But I do have to give you some warnings. First of all, AA is wrought with human viewpoint. They will hit on some things that are absolutely correct, but it's always going to be watered down with some type of human viewpoint because the unbeliever can never understand the spiritual life. It doesn't matter if they're recovering or not. And you may go to an AA meeting and think, oh, everyone there is a believer because they all talk about God or whatnot. But it's not necessarily true. They could be a Jew. Jews talk about God. It could be a Muslim. Muslims talk about God. They say Allah, but still. And so, should you go? Well, if it keeps you from drinking, keep going. 
It's better to uh, have AA as a crutch than alcohol. So that's my point. But AA would still be a crutch. Now, oftentimes, alcoholics go to AA because AA brings along with it a social life where there's no drinking. Now, as, since alcohol is part of culture, a lot of people can go out and 90% of the population can have a few drinks and go home and, and not even desire one more drop. That's not the alcoholic's genetic makeup. It's impossible. One drink and that's it. You, you just, you're, you're going to want, at least, to get plastered. That is the genetic makeup of the alcoholic. And so if you go to AA and you say it keeps me from drinking, hey, it's better that AA be a crutch than alcohol, because alcohol will kill you, AA will not. Now, again, since alcohol is a part of culture, AA often provides a social outlet. Now, social life is not the spiritual life, of course, but a lot of times, uh, in culture, if you have to go out somewhere, they say we're going to go out and have a few drinks. The alcoholic can't do that. They have to be teetotalers, and so they have function like dances and whatnot, so that you can uh, have a social life with people who don't drink, supposedly don't drink, or at least they shouldn't be. At least that is the theory behind it. And so you can have feel as if you're having a normal social life and a normal part of society, even though you don't drink because drinking is a part of culture and drinking in itself is not sin. Drunkenness always is. Always. And of course there's nothing wrong with social life. You just have to have your priorities straight with regard to the Word of God. And if you have your priorities straight with regard to the Word of God, then eventually you won't need AA as a crutch even. You'll just uh, have the spiritual self-sustainability related to post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. And you will have the wherewithal to continue on your own, but that may be decades in the making. So if it helps you go, that's the advice I'll give you. If you think it helps you to keep from taking that one drink, go. If you uh, think that it's a bunch of garbage, and you don't like it, and it's a lot of human viewpoint, and the people there make you want to drink, then stay home. Just common sense related to that. Now, there's genetic factors related to it, and it's related to the old sin nature, and a lot of this comes out in medical science, how it is genetic. It's not a disease, but it's genetically related. And, uh, you know, some people say, well, homosexuality is a disease, truth is, it's not. It, it might be related to a genetic makeup. Might be. And uh, a lot of times it's more related to an environmental circumstance, and sometimes alcoholism is too, because the only thing you have to do to become an alcoholic is just to drink so much that you become physically dependent upon it, yet there are those components related to genes, related to genetics. And there's a lot more alcoholics in Ohio than South Carolina because in Ohio we have a lot of Irish Catholics who have both the genes and the environmental background in which drinking is totally accepted. Totally and completely accepted by the Catholic Church. And so there are more alcoholics in the North. So let me read from the book again. The physician who, at our request, gave us this letter has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement he confirms what we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe, that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. It did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life. Yet that's actually a great part of it. And that's an aside, but again, there's a lot of human viewpoint involved. And uh, someone could look at an alcoholic and say they are totally maladjusted to life. They would be correct. They would be right. And it might be hard to swallow if you're an alcoholic, but it's true. You're maladjusted to life. Life has its up and ups and downs. You don't like the downs, so you take a drink. Maladjustment. that we were in full flight from reality. 
actually the alcoholic is in full flight from reality. And the reason why many, uh, many people go in that direction is uh, oftentimes uh, due to the environment of child abuse and whatnot, in which you can't handle the harsh reality of life and you consider uh, even the smallest of infractions against you to be just as awful as the experience you had as a child sexual, sexually molested, etc. But it's not. It's not the same and you're maladjusted to life because you didn't learn those things, but you're alive so you have the chance. And you can't go through life blaming everything on everyone else. And that's the first step, by the way. Rebound! Name it to God! Not as, now they have a step number five in this book is name it to God and then to a whole bunch of other people. Wrong. Name it to God's right. They got that right. You have to admit it. So you admit it to God and that's it. Everyone else knows it anyway. So you have the overt type sinning. Everyone knows. You're not hiding it from them anyway. And you don't have to run around and make apologies to other people, which is part of step number five. But you do need to name it to God, and they got that part right. But an unbeliever can name it to God all they want, and it's meaningless, except maybe to their own psychology. Now these things, now I'm continuing reading here. These things were true to some extent. In fact, see, he even admits that's true. These things were true to some extent. In fact, to a considerable extent with some of us. But we are sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out the physical factor is incomplete. And that's true, especially when you go to the point to where you're physically addicted. You don't have to go to that point, but many do. The doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. And as laymen, our opinion as to its soundness may of course mean little, but as ex-problem drinkers, we can say that his explanation makes good common sense. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. Though we work out our solution on the spiritual as well as the altruistic plane, we favor hospitalization for the alcoholic who is very jittery or befogged, as I told you earlier. That was one of the parameters that I set forth. Though we work out our solution on the spiritual as well as the altruistic plane, we favor hospitalization for the alcoholic who is very jittery or befogged. More often than not, it is imperative that a man's brain be cleared before he is approached, as he has then a better chance of understanding and accepting what we have to offer. And what he's saying is, look, before you can ever, ever recover mentally, and this is just from a human viewpoint view, which is common sense, before you can ever recover mentally, you're going to have to wean your body off of it. Because uh, when the body and the mind are working in sync like that, it's a power that is beyond normal control. We're going to need medicine from a medical doctor. And uh, they've had medicine for this for many, many, many years. One of the first medicines they came out with is something called li Librium. And those are the nerve pills that your grandma and grandpa probably talked a lot about because that's when they first came out. Or, well, if you're my age, grandma and grandpa, that would be uh, at least um, if you had uh, the grandma and grandpa I had, or what I called Papa and Nanny, uh, they lived in the South, we called them Papa and Nanny. They, uh, they would always, I would always hear something about nerve pill, nerve pill this, nerve pill that. It's something that they had just come out with while they were uh, growing up. Now I'm going to quote here from the doctor. The subject presented in this book seems to me to be of paramount importance to those afflicted with alcoholic addiction. I say this after many years experience as medical director of one of the oldest hospitals in the country treating alcohol and drug addiction. There was, therefore, a sense of real satisfaction when I was asked to contribute a few words on the subject which is covered in such master, masterly detail in these pages. We doctors have realized for a long time that some form of moral psychology was of urgent importance to alcoholics. In other words, uh, they're going to have to have something uh, of power beyond themselves, and what 
we will relate to is the unique spiritual life. They will relate to human viewpoint, psychology, and ideas that are helpful for the unbeliever. They can be helpful for the believer negative toward doctrine even to keep away from alcohol. But if you have Bible doctrine, that is the greatest of all solutions, period. The greatest thing you could ever do is to simply grow in grace and in knowledge. And that's not to say you'll never slip up again. You will. It is to say that you actually have a roaring chance of success, not only to rid yourself of that problem, but to also execute the spiritual life and receive great reward in heaven. And while people were calling you drunk on earth, they're going to be awfully shocked to see you in heaven with some rewards. Why? Well, you recovered, and you didn't make a big deal out of it, a big show. And you didn't run around and talk about Christ and how he did it for you, etc. And how you gave this up and that up and how it was you, you, you because you were adjusted to life finally and you realized it was more about grace than it was about you. And so you kick arrogance to the side and you don't make a big show of it. And so people just remember you as you were and they'll never let it drop. And oftentimes it is related to the fact that you do get on Bible doctrine and they hate that. The cosmic system always hates it when anyone gets with the Word of God. And it doesn't matter how far you grow spiritually, that's how you'll be remembered. So it doesn't matter what others think. And that's why it doesn't matter to even name it to other people, which is the fifth step in this book, which is wrong. Now they do say name it to God, that's right, if you're a believer. But they did, they tried, what they did is they came up with the physical solution, which is wonderful. This book describes the, the physical solution to it as going to the doctor, period, going to a hospital, and that's how you recover physically. Then they try to bring in the spiritual aspects because the, these doctors realized that outside of a, a power that is a stronger than an earthly power, it's going to be very difficult for the alcoholic to stay away from alcohol. Very difficult. And even with the spiritual power, it may be difficult because it's part of your old sin nature, part of your weakness, even a genetic part for 10% of the population. That's what's estimated. Later, he requested the privilege of being allowed to tell his story to other patients here, and with some misgiving, we consented. The cases we have followed through have been most interesting. In fact, many of them are amazing. The unselfishness of these men, as we have come to know them, the entire absence of profit motive, and their community spirit is indeed inspiring to one who has labored long and wearily in this alcoholic field. They believe in themselves, and still more, in the power of which pulls chronic alcoholics back from the gates of death. And right here in the book, the word power is capitalized. Now this is from a doctor capitalizing the word power. Why? He say it's related to God. And in the 1930s, it kind of shows how far we've gone down as a country. In the 1930s, doctors would talk about things related to or tried to at least, intermingle Bible doctrine with what they are trying to solve in a simple physical way. So um, the thing is, we do need a power. And what is that power? It's the power of the filling of God the Holy Spirit. That is the power that we have. Now, of course, you read about number one, step one, if you're an alcoholic, and let's say you've already done the treatment thing and you are weaned from it physically, but you're an alcoholic and you still have the urges and you still slip up from time to time. What's the first thing? Name it. Name it. Name it. Name it. To God only. It's no one else's business. They'll know it anyway. And they'll harass you about it. But it's you just go straight to God and say, I got drunk. And that's it. It's over. And then what do you do? You name it. You see, there's actually four steps to rebound that we'll get into uh, in the next message. I need to wrap it up here. But here we have, name it, 
Name it to God. The next thing, disregard it. Forget about it. But you're never going to forget it. I mean, if you have a memory like mine, you're not going to forget much of anything. However, if you if you really sm uh, totally smashed, then you might not remember. But disregard it. And it doesn't mean to forget necessarily. It means to simply understand that you're a sinner like everyone else. They just have a different area of weakness than you. And to name it, just as they need to name their area where they've sinned, period. Now, I don't run up to self-righteous people and say, you're self-righteous and you have a problem. No more than I'd run up to somebody who's over-drinking and tell them that because it's not my business. You still have the privacy of the priesthood and that's one big problem when it comes to overt sinning. And that is the fact that people will always, with the overt type sins, think that they have a right to stick their nose into your business when they do not. And just ignore the ringing. Maybe that's the sign I need to close up here. So uh, we'll continue with the study. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity to study these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and challenge us to what we have studied. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.